Hi everyone, welcome to week one. This lecture is meant to be viewed at, after you, you viewed the lecture called Start the Course Here. In that lecture, I went through how the Blackboard site is set up. In this lecture, we're going to talk about expectations for the course and move on to what we're going to talk about in week one, which is the importance of strategic planning. So let's just jump right into that. So, learning objectives for this week. I, this is a little bit redundant, but the first is that you'll read and understand the syllabus. The second is you'll read and understand the Blackboard site. The third expectation is that we'll, each of you will introduce yourself and read introductions from the others. That's a required discussion this week. The fourth is that each of you will participate in a discussion of the importance of strategic planning. And the fifth is that you will email me with your concerns promptly, as I said. Um, so each week in the course, uh, again, this is redundant and you'll find the Blackboard site is a little bit redundant too, but redundancy sometimes helps the learning effort. The course is organized by week. So you'll note I have a week one tab, uh, of things that I want you to do and I have a week one tab for the discussion. So each week there'll be a week one tab, a week two tab, a week three tab, and those will open up as we enter the week. Um, typically the, the weekly tabs will open up on Friday. So the course starts on the 22nd, which is a Monday. Everything you need for week one will be open no later than six o'clock in the morning on Friday the 19th. That means that all the week two things will be open no later than Friday the 26th of August by 6 in the morning. My weeks actually start on Sunday and end on Saturday. So everything's organized by week. Each week features a discussion board and the purpose is to demonstrate learning and to have class participation. So you get out of it what you put in it. There are six written assignments throughout the course. Two of them are independent assignments. Um, little, I call them short analysis essays, and four of them directly relate to the term project. So the term project isn't just a paper you turn in at the end. The term project consists of a proposal paper. It consists of an interview plan because part of your term project is interviewing a person from a public or nonprofit organization. The, the third portion of the term project is an outline that I'll have you turn in, and the final portion is the paper itself. So I take this in chunks to so that you can build confidence as you go along uh, in, in writing your term paper. Um, each week you can expect readings from the Bryson text or supplemental text. Sometimes I'll give you an article to read or available online sites, which I will post. So for example, I might ask you to look at uh, the Food Bank for the Heartland website. That's one I use. And then each week you can expect a PowerPoint lecture like this. And this is not a substitute for other assigned work, including the reading, but it just highlights things that I want you to, to really pay attention to. I would expect you to do the readings and the other activities in addition to listening to this lecture. I, I went over this in the previous lecture, so this may be a little bit redundant, but those are the point values. Um, 275 points for this course. At the end of the semester, I divide the number of points you have by 275 and that determines your grade. You can follow along with where you're at point-wise by going to the My Grades tab on your Blackboard site. And I would encourage you to do that. But each week there will be something graded. Um, so it, for during each week, there will be at least five points of grade, and that has to do with the discussion. Other weeks, these other requirements will, will be um, graded as well. So you can see, for example, the, all the written work, if you look at the due dates on this slide, they're spread out throughout the semester. Most of, most of the written work are 25 points each, with the exception of the final term project paper which is 75 points. That is a required, that is a required 
project and you really can't complete the course without that one so please please do that one okay let me get to the heart of week one and I say why strategic planning um, and I ha I'm having you look at this planet money makes a t-shirt that that presentation's a uh, maybe three or four years old by now but I really like it because I like it because it highlights the world we live in, the globalized world we live in. I mentioned that this particular presidential election is very contentious, and I think you all know that. You could almost be asleep uh, and realize how contentious this presidential election is. It's one of the most contentious ones I've seen in my lifetime. Um, one of the issues that has really come up uh, is this issue of globalization, and both parties have have talked about um, something called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is a treaty being organ uh, being negotiated and uh, by the Obama administration and sent to the the Senate for ratification. And it's similar to something called NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Act. And both of those are controversial. They're controversial for a variety of reasons, and. Uh, they're controversial because some people contend that uh, free trade takes jobs away from people who live in the United States. Some people contend that free trade actually drives down wages for people worldwide. Some people contend that free trade makes, uh, makes it possible for people to migrate and immigrate uh, around the globe. Um, I'm not going to give you my opinion of the Trans-Pacific Partnership or my opinion of NAFTA because my opinion happens to be irrelevant at this point. What I will tell you is this, that globalization is an empirical fact. Um, this, this debate over globalization is kind of interesting as, a, as an instructor because to me it points out the difference between what we call normative theory and empirical theory. Normative theory is just making a theory about what we think should be done. We think, for example, uh, classroom sizes in K-12 education should be smaller. We think that's the way it should be done. We think that, um, we think that, I am very sorry, my phone was ringing. I shut it off there. Um, let me start over. So normative theory is what we think should be done. For example, we think classrooms should be smaller. Empirical theory is what we actually observe and what we what the results are from what we observe. Um, you know, we can do studies on classroom size and observe whether or not scores are affected um, if the class if the classroom ratio is one teacher to 15 students or one teacher to 35 students in K-12 education. That's empirical theory. Well, globalization is just empirical. The fact of the matter is the world um, that your parents and grandparents knew is not the world of today. And that's why I have you watch that Planet Money t-shirt. Um, and so the world has changed and the United States has changed. And I'm going to connect this to why I think strategic planning is, is important. Um, back in the year 2000, this author, Robert Putnam, he's a professor, he wrote a book called Bowling Alone. It was a really famous book in the year 2000. Now the year 2000 was prior to the explosion in social media. It was really prior to Facebook. Um, it was prior to Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. It was prior to all of those things being in innovated in our society. Uh, but what he said in the year 2000 was that people have lost social capital. He calls it bullying alone because his contention is that in cities and towns across the United States, People used to join organizations, and he uses the example of a bowling league. People would join bowling leagues, and they would bowl together on Wednesday night or Thursday night, and they would, in that way, associate with each other. Or they would join civic organizations, or they would join religious organizations like churches or synagogues or temples and or mosques, and they would they would have these outlets to to build social capital which he defines as a goodwill, fellowship, sympathy, and social intercourse. But his contention was that by the year 2000, we had lost that. Now, multiply that by social media and figure out 
if we are lacking in goodwill, fellowship, sympathy, and social intercourse. The second point I want to make uh, is that demographic changes in the United States and around the world have increased mobility and immigration. The population is aging in Western nations at least, and in um, Middle Eastern nations in particular, there is a youthful population bulge. And in the public sector where uh, I work and a lot of other people work, government is being replaced by governance, which is the idea that uh, it's not just this government hierarchy that does government work. Actually, the work of government is done through nonprofits. It's done through for-profit organizations in some cases. Uh, it's done by volunteers. It's done by quasi-government organizations. So what are the implications of all this globalization that we can observe? And that is that organizations must understand who they are in this globalized environment in order to succeed and work within a network of, or of organizations. And they must understand the value they create and how to increase that value. So here's a little bit of what I'm talking about. Um, this happens to be the United States. That uh, dotted line is total dependency. The sort of lighter line is youth dependency and the dark blue line is old age dependency. Well, what does that mean? So go to the bottom of the slide in the year 2015. Um, and what this refers to is the ratio of young people who are not working age, um, that is people under 18, and aged people, that is people 65 and over, and those are people generally who are drawing social security, um, although the, the minimum age of social security is rising, um, compared to what we would call the working age population, and that would be people between 18 to 64. So go to the left hand side and just look at the old age dependency and you can see somewhere in excess of 20% there's a 20% dependency that's people over 65 to working age people but look go way over to the right hand side and look at the year 2060 and you can see that um, there will be now a 40% in excess of 40% old age dependency. That means um, for every 10 working age people, there will be four people who are um, over 65. And then when you compound that with the youth dependency, the dotted line on top, by the year 2060, somewhere around 75% dependency rate will exist. Meaning that the working age population theoretically is taking care of, if you will, uh, that many people. So there will be less workers per youth and less workers per old person by the year 2060. So what kind of social implications does that have? You can kind of think about that and figure out the social implications of that. Uh, and the most obvious one for old people is that our social security system is based on all of us paying payroll taxes. I pay payroll taxes for on all my income. Now, I can say that when I turn 67 and I start drawing social security, if I choose to do that, I could wait till I'm 70. If I, if I choose to do that, I could say, well, I paid into social security. But the fact of the matter is, um, if I live the life expectancy that I would be expected to live, barring some catastrophic illness, I'm probably going to live to about 84. Well, the money I draw from Social Security is going to be far more than I have put into it in my working age years. That means that the working age people are actually funding um, the, the old age people, and this is what we call generational redistribution. And so if there are more aged people, that means that the working age people uh, ha will have to have an increase in payroll taxes or will have to reduce the benefits, or we'll have to do something. There are implications to that. There's another implication in the United States, and this is switching gears, and this has to do with nativity or place of birth. So what this chart shows, this is from the census, is um, people in the United States, the percent of people in the United States who are foreign born, and that's what that black line is in each chart. So uh, in 2014, 3.4% 
of the under 18 population was born outside of the United States. That's the upper left hand chart. Um, however, uh, in 2014, 17.3% of the 18 to 44 aged people were born outside of the United States. So what we see uh, in the bottom two charts is that, or in all these charts, is that the percentage of people born outside of the United States is rising across the board. So that um, by the year um, 2060, again, in the working age cohort, that's 45 to 64, about a quarter of those people will have been born outside of the United States. Well, what does that mean? Maybe it means nothing. Um, it may mean something though, and there may be social implications to how our society is changing. These are things that you as individuals and we as people who work in government and nonprofit organizations have to figure out how do these kinds of trends affect us? They may not affect us at all, but they may have some effect. And that is what strategic planning is all about, figuring out how social trends affect us, figuring out the environment in which we work, and then making strategies to deal with the environment in which we work. So again, the Bryson text talks about this. What is strategic planning? Well, Bryson says that it is a deliberative, disciplined approach to producing fundamental decisions and actions that shape and guide what an organization or other entity is, what it does, and why. Okay, so what does strategic planning do for us? Um, for example, in the nonprofit that you plan on starting in two years, what will strategic planning do for you? Well, it will help you to gather, analyze, and synthesize information. And I just gave the example of information about the environment in which your organization might operate. It will help you produce judgments among decision makers about desirable, feasible, defensible, and acceptable missions, goals, strategies, and actions. It will help you address key organizational issues. It will enhance your organizational learning, and it will create significant and enduring public value. So right there in a nutshell, I want to stop on this slide for just a second. And here's what I, I want to relate this to your term project. What your term project is going to help you to do is find one public or nonprofit organization. I'm going to ask you to go out and find that organization. And then I'm going to ask you to just dip your toe in the water a little bit in the world of strategic planning and come up with some strategic planning actions for that particular organization. This is how all this course hangs together, right here. Um, your term project and your written work, that is your short analysis essays, all help you, if you will, sample strategic planning just a little bit for real world organizations and come up with solutions that would help that organization from a strategic standpoint. So this chart is hard to read. It's a PDF picture I took of this and it's in your book. It's in your book though at page 11. So this talks about what kind of the ABCs of strategic planning, what Bryson says. And I want you to really just concentrate on two things. And then I want you to, as you're reading this week, this is the assigned reading. I want you to dwell on this chart on page 11 of your book for a little bit because it's important. So what is strategic planning? Really in a nutshell, here's what it is. If you're in an organization, strategic planning first tells you where you're where you are. You have to think about where you are as an organization. And we're going to be talking about these things as we move along through the semester. We're going to be talking about something called mission and mandates, structure and systems, communications, programs and services. So in other words, where are you as an organization? And then strategic planning helps you figure out where you want to be. What kind of organization do you want to be? And then finally, how do you get there? And that is your strategic plan. So really, in a, in a sense, you can do this as an organization, or you can do this as yourself, as a person getting ready to graduate from UNO. You can say, where am I right now? Well, where do I want to be? 
That's your goal. And how do I get there? That's your plan. So we can all engage in strategic planning, really, and it doesn't have to be this long, drawn-out, formal thing. It can be as simple as putting to paper these kinds of things. This is impossible to read, <laughs> um, but I have it there for a reason, because this is on page 44 uh, and 45 of the Bryson text. And we're going to be referring to page 44 and 45 of the text as we go through the semester. This is what Bryson calls the 10-step strategy change cycle. What we're not going to do is we're not going to go through this step by step. It's not going to be week one is step one, week two is step two, week three is step three. It's not going to go like that. I'm going to refer to different parts of this step, but we're going to constantly refer back to this week by week thing, this strategy change cycle. And I want you to understand this is how Bryson talks about this, the strategy change cycle. We will refer back to it quite often during the course and so I want you to be aware that it's there and I want you to spend some time digesting it. You don't have to memorize it but it's important to understand that this is a cycle. So what strategic planning is not and again you know it, this could apply to an organization or, or you yourself. It's not a panacea. So um, a classic kind of bad leadership movie is a movie called Office Space. It it, um, it was produced way back in the 90s. Um, it's To me, it's a hilarious movie, but what it talks about is um, really a, just a dysfunctional organization, and yet the, the boss in the organization is a, is a huge fan of strategic planning. Um, and basically, he has strategic plans sitting on his bookshelf, and he never looks at them. Strategic planning is not a panacea. If you're in an organization that's dysfunctional and somebody says, let's do a strategic plan and that will fix everything, it won't solve all your problems. In fact, strategic planning is not always advisable. There may be organizations where literally the roof has fallen in and you just need to fix what's wrong right then. Um, and organizations that really lack the leadership commitment to make a strategic plan, if they're just trying to paint over uh, you know, a bad looking wall with one thin coat of paint, so to speak, strategic planning is not going to work. And this to me is really key. Strategic planning is not an effort just to create some formal plan that no one reads. That is really important to me. As we go through this semester, what I want you to be thinking about is strategic thinking. Um, you know, what is it our organization does? Going back to that cycle slide, where are we now, where do we want to go, and how do we get there? That is strategic thinking. And whether it's formalized in a nice looking plan that you had published by some binding company is not really the important issue. The important issue is that you're engaging in strategic thinking. And hopefully during the, the course of this semester, we will get to that point and why that's important. So some things to consider as you do the reading this week. Um, one, the meaning of strategic planning as a deliberative approach. Um, two, and I, we talked about this, the importance of strategic planning and why it's growing more important now than ever before. Um, and three, as I just emphasized, that the idea of strategic planning is not really just creating some document. It's thinking about who, we, who you are, where you want to go, how you, how you want to get there. And finally, this 10-step model in the Bryson text. As I said, we will not go through it step by step, week by week, but we will cover important aspects of the model. So, my reference page ends this presentation for the week. So, this week there is a discussion. In fact, there are two discussions. One is the introduction discussion. The second is um, why strategic planning is important. Those are posted on the week one discussion board. Uh, and I want you to encourage you all, in fact, you're required to do it, you get a grade for it, to do those this week. I look forward to this semester and spending some time with you talking about strategic planning. Please do email me if you have concerns or questions. Thank you very much.